Well, folks, it's uh, good to see you, and uh, just remind you that after the service tonight, there's a wee cup of tea and coffee in the foyer area. Make sure you can stay behind for that. Uh, there's a wee announcement sheet you'll find some in the foyer area, and I'll let you know all the things that are going on this week, and if you're interested in any of those things, uh, please speak to me afterwards. I'm going to sing together. It's a lovely hymn, uh, Be Thou My Vision. We'll stand as we worship. I'm not quite sure if those words really fit it in that well. We have two versions, and I think I put the wrong version on, so I'll need to remember, I'll delete this version tonight, and then next time we sing it, the version should be all right. So that, that was my fault, sorry about that. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you've been with us today. Uh, we've been involved in lots of different things. We thank you that you've led and you've guided we thank you, Lord, that you've helped us as we've spent time with our family and our friends. We've had opportunity to rest and relax. And tonight, Lord, as we spend this short time in your presence, Lord, speak to us. Help us to see you tonight. We know, Lord, that you're invisible, but we can sense your presence. For you promise that when we're together like this, you're here in this room. And you're here to minister into our hearts to make us more like yourself, to reassure us of who we are and what we are in you. And so, Lord, be with us in all that we sing and say tonight, that we might honour your name. Father, again, we come, we want to pray uh, for our community. We, we recognise that we are in a difficult time in this country. We, we understand that, that no one is sure what, what way Brexit will work. There's lots of people will say that we will be worse off by 12% and 15% or maybe even 20%. And Lord, not only is Brexit a problem, uh, we recognize that our own government here in Stormont is a problem. That they cannot agree for disagreeing. 
There's an unwillingness to see someone else's point of view. But there's also an unwillingness, it seems, to govern faithfully. And so we come and we want to pray for those, those people particularly who are MLAs. And it is so easy for them to blame one another. It's so easy to say that if they were in this situation or that situation, things are different. The issue is we're in this situation. And we want to pray for courage and wisdom, understanding, that, Father, the right thing will be done for the right reason. So we pray for those who call themselves MLAs, that, Father, you will work in their hearts, and that, Father, we will have a government in this place that will govern justly, with everyone in mind, not just a select few. So we pray for our government. Lord, we pray for wisdom for them. And Lord, be with each one of us that we may be good citizens. Now what we pray for them, we pray for ourselves. That you will give us courage and grace and wisdom. Lead us in all that we do this week that we might honour your name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing again. Uh, hopefully I've got the words right this time. It's Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it. We'll stand as we worship. going to read uh, from the Bible. It's from Matthew chapter 25. And we're looking at the parable, a parable based on a wedding, a parable of, of, the, of, the, of the virgins coming along to the wedding. It's, it's Matthew chapter 25. We'll read from verse 1. This is God's word. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. 
At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, They may, may, may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Amen. Let's all pray. Father, as we come and as we study your word, help us to understand it. We, we thank you for this story. And, and for most of us here tonight, this story is a bit strange. It, it speaks of something that we don't really understand. So help us as we think about it, uh, that we might fully understand what you were getting at when you told this story. That those people who first heard it, and they would have understood it, that we might be like them. That we might read it and understand it, and in understanding it, that we will trust you. So help us as we read, help us to understand. Speak into our hearts, that we might hear you, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I might leave out the next hymn and then she's going to the sermon, if that's all right. Here, here's a story that uh, maybe for some of us is quite uh, unfamiliar. This is a parable. Uh, we, we looked at parables before and realized that a parable is a story that is trying to help us to understand something else, that the word parable really means putting alongside uh, uh, something. So it's, like, it's almost like a ruler, that if you wanted to know the length of something, you put a ruler alongside what you want to know the length of, and it will tell you the length of it. Or it's like a gauge in the oil. I don't know if you still have oil. Most of us have gas. But uh, we, we used to have oil in the manse, and I had this gauge. And when I first came uh, to the manse, I thought the gauge was right. And so I followed the gauge. And I thought, this is a great house, because this house, even though I burn oil, it never uses any oil, because the gauge still stays the same. I thought, it must be because it's a Christian house, and God doesn't let me burn any oil. He must just keep it in that. I thought it was a miracle. Until one day we put the heat on, and the heat didn't come on. And I went and checked, and, and there was half a, a amount of oil in it. Because the wee bubble thing that tells you there's half full, tells me it's half full. And so I then climbed up on top of it, and I got a big stick and put it down. And it was empty, because the gauge wasn't working. A gauge only works, or is only useful if it works, and this didn't work. So this is a parable. It's a gauge. It's to help us to understand what Jesus is trying to say. And it's the story of, I don't know if you've ever been to a wedding. I was in hospital about a couple of years ago. Uh, I was lying in the royal, and, and all the men were talking about their wives and all went on. And I said, well, that's like, you know, I've married about 130, 140 women in my time. And I said, what? I said, yes, I've married about 130, 140 women. And I said, you're joking me. I said, no, honestly. And one of them said, you're Mormon. I said, no, 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 I'm not Mormon. But they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. No, that cannot be the case. I said, I promise you, I've married about 130, 140 women. And I said, no. And then I thought I would mix it a wee bit. And then I said, well, actually, to be honest, I've also married about 130, 140 men. Well, they didn't like that idea at all. And uh, so I had to be better tell them that I was a minister. And so I've done lots of weddings. And have lots of stories. We, we, we have a lot of tradition, uh, don't we, in this culture. One of the traditions, actually, in our culture is that the man arrives first and the woman arrives. One time in Market Hill, uh, I was doing the wedding, and, uh, and the bride was five minutes late, and she was 10 minutes late. She was 15 minutes late. She was 20 minutes late. She was 30 minutes late. And so that I tried to put the, the bride, uh, at the other bridegroom at ease, I said, uh, See if she's much later. Do we still get the food? I said. I mean, we don't need to worry about doing the wedding, but the food will be okay. He says, Oh, Danny, he says, Don't worry, we'll still have the food. 
He wasn't about first. I think he was hoping she wouldn't turn up. She was 45 minutes late. She came in a horse and cart, well, a horse and carriage, sorry, from, from Portadown. The horse had to stop three times. She was a big girl. And, and, uh, and the horse had to stop. That's no word of a lie. That's why she was so late. <laughs> the guy thought, oh my goodness. He said, I'll have to stop and give the horse a rest. It was a nightmare. There was this guy I was marrying who, who was from Market Hill, and he was a gangster uh, in Market Hill. And, uh, and I was standing and talked to him, and I thought, I thought I smelled a wee bit of drink. And I said to him, I'm sorry, but this wedding can't go on. And he said, sorry? I said, well, if you had drink in you at all, then I'm not performing this wedding. If you're drunk, you can't do the wedding. He said, oh, I'm not drunk, Reverend Link, I'm not drunk. I've only had one or two. I said, I'm sorry, the wedding's not on. And, but he really sobered up well. And after about five, ten minutes, I said, I'll tell you what, then I'll go ahead with it. I had every intention of going ahead with it, but he was a real gangster, you know, a real cool dude in the time. That particular wedding, they, they split up half, no, no, it's not true, maybe about an hour after the wedding. And that was it. She went home with her dad, and, and that was the end of the marriage. The marriage broke up an hour after the wedding. I won't tell you what he did, but that marriage broke up an hour after the wedding. So we have lots of of stories you hear about weddings, a lot of nightmares about weddings. Well, here's in, in the tradition in, in this culture. Actually, it's the same tradition in Thailand, is that uh, the bride, in, in our culture, the bridegroom comes to the wedding, and the, uh, or the bride comes to the wedding, and the bridegroom is waiting. He has to always be early. In, in this culture, in Eastern culture, and in Thai culture, it's the same. It's the bridegroom who comes to the bride. He comes to her village, and he takes her, and then he takes her, and then the ceremony is, 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 takes place. And that's what the culture is here. So the, the bridegroom comes, and when he arrives, then that's the time for the wedding, and, 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 the, and, and the wedding can take place, and it's a big festival. And in this culture, then, you have bridesmaids, but the bridesmaids uh, are... In this culture, we have a, you can have a bridesmaid who is married, and it's called a, a, a matron of honour. Well, well in, in, in Eastern culture, you cannot have a bridesmaid who is married. They all have to be single. And so here's 10 bridesmaids they have. And the, and the culture is that they, they wait until he comes, and then he comes with the bridesmaids into the marriage ceremony, and then they get married, the bride, and then get married. That's the culture. And so what happens is they wait for him, and then whenever he arrives, they come in together. Well, this particular time, uh, they wait. And if you're wise, then you would have an oil lamp. And uh, because he has to go from his village uh, to your village. And so they're waiting for him to come. And they're waiting. And there's ten virgins, ten bridesmaids waiting for him to come. Five of them have a bit of wit. Because they recognize he might be coming in that horse and cart from Portadown. In other words, he might be coming, he might take longer than what you think. And so they come prepared with the oil in their lamps, and all ten of them have oil in their lamps. So it's not that the, the five come with no oils in their lamps, that's not true. They all come, and their lamps are full of oil, and, uh, and they have the lamp ready. So they're all ready for the, for the bridegroom coming. But five of them are really wise, because they recognize that if he's late, they might run out of oil. And so they bring extra oil with them. They bring oil in a jar so that if the oil in the lamp runs out, they can fill it up. So they're all ready for the bridegroom coming. They all expect him to come. They're all bridesmaids. And they all have oil in their lamp and it's all full. But five of them are, are wise because they bring extra just in case the bridegroom is later. And of course, that's exactly what happens. It's not just later, but it's really late. It's far later than they expected. So much so that most of them are drowsing off. But eventually they hear he's coming. And whenever he's coming then, it's at midnight, it's dark. And they all go out to shine their lamps to bring him in. But the problem is, because he was far later than they thought he would be, five of them don't have enough oil. In fact, their lamps are going out. And so they asked to borrow some of the oil from the, the five wise ones. And they said, look, we, can't, we haven't got enough for ours and for yours. You'll have to go and buy it. And while they go to buy it, the bridegroom arrives. And they go in 
to have the festivities. And while they're in, in, in that culture at night time, once you close the door, and Thai culture is the same, once you close the door of your house, you will not open it unless you're absolutely sure who you are. In Thai culture, you don't knock on the door. In our culture, uh, we all have doors, and you knock on the door or you ring the bell. Or nowadays what happens is, and, and that's happened sometimes with Stephen's friends, Stephen's friends will phone him from our front door and say, Stephen, I'm out of your door. And Stephen will say, I'm away to get my friend. That's what I mean. He says, out of the door. We have a doorbell and we have a door knocker. But he will phone David or Stephen from outside to say that he's at the front door. That's the culture nowadays, apparently. But when you know they're out there and you open the door and you bring them in. Well, in Eastern culture and in, in Thai culture, there is no door usually. Uh, we had a front door in our house, but most Thai folk don't. And what you do actually, you stand just outside the gate and you shout in. And if they want you to come in, they'll shout, come on in, and you come in. If they don't want you to come in, you don't shout. And even though you know they're in the home, if they don't shout for you to come in, you don't go in. It's against the culture. And that's what's happening here. They go and they get the oil, and by the time they come back, the party started. And they knock on the door, they try to get in. But no one will open the door at night time. That's what happened, if you remember, in the upper room uh, at the day of Pentecost. The, the, the disciples are in the upper room and they're afraid of the Jews. No one will open that door to anybody. And so the Bible tells us that while the disciples are praying, for fear of the Jews, they've got the door closed and Jesus appears. If Jesus had come and knocked the door, they wouldn't have opened the door to Jesus. But the Bible tells us that Jesus appears to them. And they're absolutely amazed. They're amazed for two reasons. They're amazed because it's Jesus. And they're also amazed because how did they get in? Because no one would let them in the door. Because you don't open your door when it's dark. You just don't do it in Eastern culture. And so here, because it sounds a bit odd that there's these bridesmaids when they come, they don't get in. Once the door is closed in Eastern culture at night time, it's not open for anybody. And that's why there's another parable that Jesus tells that is amazing that eventually someone opens the door to them because you don't do that in Eastern culture. So what's that parable about then? It seems a strange parable. You've got ten bridesmaids, five of them are wise, five of them are foolish. Five of them have enough oil in their lamps plus extra oil just in case he's late. And of course he is late. The other five go off to get oil. When they come back, the party's already started and they're not allowed in. Because the door is closed. Jesus tells that parable to tell them what it's about. That whenever he leaves them, and whenever he dies, and he is raised again from the dead, he then ascends into heaven. But he says, one day I will come back again. And when I come back again, I'm going to take you to be with myself. And, and uh, so he's talking that he'll come back. And it's called the second coming. Lots of people don't believe it. It was like the day of the wedding for that bride who was 45 minutes late. Some folk had even talked about going down at the time for a coffee because they thought actually she wasn't going to turn up. But she was only 45 minutes late. But Jesus is saying that when he comes back, most, most people will not expect it. And here these 10 virgins were not expecting him to come back when he did because he took longer than what they thought. And that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that when I come back, you might not expect me to be back. But when I come back, make sure you're ready. In other words, what he's saying is we don't know when Jesus will come back, but he's definitely coming back. And even though people might say he will never come back, he's coming back. And when he comes back, we can be sure that we will see him when he comes back. And the secret is to be ready. How can we be ready? How can we be ready if we don't know when he's coming back? And how can we be ready when we notice that the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins, all of them were not ready for him coming? It tells us that we're all asleep. Because it's impossible for us to always be on the ready for Jesus coming back. When we're talking about it now, he's dead. He's, if Jesus came back now and the world ended, it wouldn't be a big surprise for us. Because we're here ready for him coming back. And if he came back, we would think, isn't it great that, that he came back when we were in church? That's the ideal situation that he finds us in church 
reading the Bible and praying. Wouldn't it be great if he came back whenever we were doing this? Because it would look as if we're really keen Christians. But the Bible tells us we don't know when. And so we might be sleeping. Or we might be watching Dundella. Although that would be a wonderful experience. We won 4-0 actually, by the way, just to let you know. But, but we might be doing something really random that, that we weren't expecting. And that's okay. That's really what Jesus is saying. When Jesus comes back, we don't know when he's coming back. And whatever we're doing, it doesn't really matter whether we're sitting here waiting for him to come back or whether we're doing something else, some everyday thing. It doesn't really matter. But what matters is that we're ready. Ready not in the sense of sitting waiting, but ready that we have the oil. What was what, he talking about the oil? Well, really, what he's talking about there is that our hearts are ready for him. That God lives within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Whenever we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that God enters into our hearts. Now, that doesn't mean that we are always conscious of God. Because sometimes we're not. And, and I'm a Christian now 45 years and there's times that I'm not conscious of God. When, when we scored four times yesterday, I was so excited that if Jesus came back, I would have been surprised because I was too busy celebrating the goals. But I'm ready. And I'm ready not because I'm constantly looking up waiting for Jesus to come back, not because I'm constantly thinking about it. I'm doing other things at times. I'm sleeping sometimes. I'm watching football sometimes. I'm, 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 I'm doing lots of other things. I'm doing with you like everyday things. But the moment that Jesus comes back, whatever I'm doing, whether I'm sleeping, I'm watching football, or whatever I'm doing, I'm ready. Why am I ready? It's because I've got the extra oil. It's because God lives within me. That's what makes the difference. It's not because I'm extra special, or it's not because that I'm, I'm, I'm constantly waiting to see, but it's because I'm already prepared. Because the preparation took place not when they were waiting, but as they were going. In other words, it's really important that we are prepared before Jesus comes back. And, 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 and once we're prepared, then we can go on with really enjoying life to the full. That's what it means. It means that once we have Christ living within us, we can really enjoy this life to the full. I gave the illustration before, but I think it's a great illustration of what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes people think that once you're a Christian, life is really boring. You, you can't have these friends or those friends. You can't do this and you can't do that. It's almost as if there's a big, long list of things that you cannot do. That's nonsense. Because once you become a Christian, then there's a whole list of things that we can do. We can talk to God and God hears us. We can read the Bible, and God promises that every time we read the Bible, he speaks to us. Not only that, when God looks at us, he sees us through the cross. He sees us through his son, Jesus. And he thinks we're absolutely wonderful. Because that's how God sees us. Because we're giving our life to him. And therefore, we can really enjoy life. So it's like this. Imagine that you're taking your wife out for a meal. And now you have to imagine that you're a man, and you also have to imagine that you're a wife. So I'm doing it from my point of view, but imagine that I take Lorraine out for a meal, and we decide to go to the Merchant Hotel. We went there, actually, we got, we got a gift of the Merchant Hotel for afternoon tea. And, uh, and you go to the Merchant Hotel, and you're eating a slap-up meal, and you're really enjoying it, and your wife says, Danny, you're wonderful. This is the best soup I've ever had. Oh, Danny, you're wonderful. This steak, it just melts in your mouth. Danny, you're wonderful. This sherry trifle is just the way I like sherry trifle. Not much trifle and plenty of sherry. And, 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 and you can have all those things. And as Lorraine's enjoying the meal, I put my hand in my pocket and realise, I've only got £10 in my pocket. Oh my goodness. So we're eating the meal, and I, I'm, I'm drinking the soup, and, and I'm eating the steak, I'm enjoying the sherry trifle. So I'm enjoying all the nice things in life. But I'm thinking to myself, oh, flip me. I've only got a ten in my pocket. And Lorraine thinks I'm the best husband who's ever lived. Because not many husbands would take her to the Merchant Hotel and give her lovely soup and give her lovely steak and give her lovely trifle. And up to that point, she thinks I'm wonderful. And then the bill comes. 
And I said to Lorraine, the bill is £142.50. And I said to Lorraine, I've only got a tenner. What does Lorraine say to Danny? You can imagine what Lorraine says to Danny. I'd still be there doing the dishes. It'd be, we, we went in, we and our honeymoon, we went for a meal. And, uh, and I didn't have much money in my pocket. And when they presented the menu, I realised we couldn't afford anything in the menu. It was really embarrassing. And I had to call the waiter over and said to him, excuse me, I can't afford anything in this menu. And he says, that's okay, sir, but I'm just going to get your coats. And he went and got our coats, and we put our coats in <laughs> bed to walk out. We didn't have, I, I didn't have enough money in my pocket. It was really embarrassing. And then he said to me, why didn't you check your pocket before you went in? I said, well, I thought it'd be cheap enough. And, but it wasn't cheap enough, and we had to leave. It was very, very embarrassing. And then he still talks about it. That was the way back in 1982. But that's what it's like being one of the, the, the five stupid virgins, one of the five stupid bridesmaids. You know, you can enjoy the anticipation of the groom coming and, and you think that you're part of the church and you might even think you're a Christian and, and you do the things that other Christians do because they had the oil the same as everybody else had. But they hadn't prepared. They hadn't thought about it. And they were just living for the day. And judgment comes. And when he comes with the bill, it's too late. If you've only got £10 in your pocket... That's what you've got. You've enjoyed all the food. But now there comes a day of reckoning and it's very embarrassing. And Jesus tells us when he comes back, if we're not his, there'll be a reckoning to be paid and that will be awful. We may have enjoyed life to the full. We may have enjoyed life as well as all the other Christians enjoy life. And, and we've, we've had a great life. And lots of people say, well, you know, I've had a great life. I've had good holidays and I had a good wife or a good husband. I've had good children. I've had a great life. But there's a day of reckoning coming. Being a Christian is something similar than that, actually, but it's different. It's going to the same hotel, the Merchant Hotel, and enjoy the same soup and the same lovely steak. It doesn't taste any better. It tastes just the same as it tasted before. And the sherry trifle is just as nice. But in my pocket, I've got £200. And when the bill comes... I pay, although you imagine a Scotsman paying 140 for a meal. We have to just, this is pretend. And, uh, and I pay it. And I have to drive home, Lorraine says, Danny, you're the best husband. Not only did she say it during the meal, but as we drive home, she says, do you know for the next year and a half, you can go to all the Dundella matches and I'll never complain. And whenever Northern Ireland's playing overseas, you can go to every match because you're a wonderful husband. That's what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you enjoy a steak better than somebody else or you enjoy soup better than somebody else, but you really enjoy this life knowing that one day God will call you home. And if Jesus was to come at any point, he will take us to be with himself. And life in heaven is so, so much better. I think that's what that parable is saying. It's not that being a Christian, life is ruined. No, as a Christian... We enjoy life to the full. And more than that, we enjoy it far more than non-Christians because our future is secure. I was talking to a man very, very recently. And he says, do Christians really believe in hell? Surely Christians can't believe in hell. Hell's a terrible place. And I said to him, it suits you not to believe in hell. It suits you not to believe in hell. He says, if I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't want to believe in hell either. Hell is such an awful place. I wouldn't want to think that that's where I would be going once I die. And so as a non-Christian, I would love the idea that there is no hell. I would love the idea that what happens is when I die, that's the end of it. There's nothing after that. Because it means I can enjoy life for 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years. And, 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 and I can honestly say at the end of that time, I've had a good innings. I've done good things. I've done some bad things. But once I die, that's the end of it. That would be okay, actually. But that's not what the Bible teaches. So whether you would want there to be a hell or not, what does the Bible teach? And the Bible actually teaches that there is a hell. And the Bible actually teaches that that hell is not for a day or two, or a year or two, but it's for eternity. And that hell doesn't need to be gone to. Because once you trust in Jesus, that hell is no longer an option. Because it's living in Christ. 
So this is a parable about ten bridesmaids. Five of them had the dresses. Five of them had the oil. Five of them had all the things that you would expect a bridesmaid to have. But they missed out because they weren't prepared. The other five, they also had the dresses. They also had the oil. But they had extra oil. They had the oil that they knew because they knew that the bridegroom might be late. And he might be very late. We have no idea when Jesus comes back. But it's really important that we're ready for when he does. Let's pray. Father, we come before you again and we thank you for this parable. This parable is really only telling us one thing. And that is, it's not what we wear or or, or the, the, the title that we have. It's not that we're the same as everybody else. But the parable is telling us that we need to be ready for when you come back. And the only way we can be ready is not to worry when you'll come back because we have no idea. But that when you do come back, that we have you as our Lord and Saviour. Help us to live in such a way. Help us to trust you that we are sure that when you come back, that we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with this evening's offerings. Our final hymn is, To God be the glory, we'll stand as we worship.
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us now and for always. Amen. Thank you.